I'm Anya Parampil reporting from Simón de Bolívar Square in Caracas where thousands of Venezuelans have been waiting in line for hours to sign an open letter to the American public denouncing U.S. intervention and aggression against their country. <laughs> There is a coup underway in Venezuela. A coup that looks suspiciously like others in the region perpetuated against democratically elected leaders who pushed back against U.S.-led neoliberal doctrine, and, hmm, suspiciously like countless others around the world in countries of geostrategic interest of the capitalist West. While coups of the past had to work a little bit harder to dress themselves up in the cloak of democracy and freedom, this one's getting pretty brazen. Yeah, well, we're in conversation with major American companies now that are either in Venezuela or in the case of Citgo here in the United States. Uh, I think we're trying to get to the same end result here. You know, uh, it'll make a big difference to the United States economically if we could have American oil companies really invest in and, and produce the oil uh, capabilities in uh, Venezuela. And yet, despite the near infinite laundry list of undemocratic coups proposed perpetuated by imperialist powers that we have all come to understand as serious crimes against humanity, and despite the laundry list of actual criminal dictators that we cozy up to happily as long as they support Western capitalist interests, somehow this issue, Venezuela, Maduro, this is the one that the neocons have right. This is the time that we should trust disgraced war criminals John Bolton and Elliot Abrams. And, you know, Donald Trump. Bomb the oil, take the oil, just take it. Bolsonaro. Yvonne Duque. Boy, there's a party in hell and everyone's invited. And why? Why is this the issue that we should trust the neocons on? Why is this the human rights issue that we are ready to invade on while we concurrently support other brutal regimes to commit ongoing human rights violations? Well, because even though 70% of Venezuela's economy is privately owned, somehow it's socialist and socialism is evil and everybody knows that. Social housing, evil. Social programs, evil. Universal healthcare, evil. And we all know where it leads, folks. You end up eating rats and zoo animals. Just ask the scientician. Uh, he and the corporate media giants will tell you that Maduro is a dangerous socialist dictator who is cruelly denying aid to his own people. And while opposition protests led mainly by well-off white people will be plastered everywhere, Chavista demonstrations happening on the same day at the same time of the same size or larger, led by Afro-Venezuelan indigenous and mestizo people, will now be seen. Man, it's almost as if Rupert Murdoch, Michael Bloomberg, and Jeff Bezos have, have some kind of stake in promoting neoliberal capitalism around the world. The corporate media also paints the opposition as fighting to restore democracy in Venezuela, which is why they have largely recognized Juan Guaido, a man who received exactly zero votes for the president of Venezuela, and a man who, until recently, about 80% of Venezuelans had no clue who he even was as the only legitimate leader of the country. Yes, the very same Juan Guaido who wants to privatize oil, social services, and housing, and let U.S. corporations take over oil production in the country. Did we mention that Venezuela has the largest oil reserves in the world? And yes, the country is deeply divided. And yes, there are a number of legitimate concerns being raised by people across the country. While it's mostly the well-off white segments of the population that furnish the opposition, there are a number of concerns being raised by people who were loyal to Chavez as well. But these concerns, like the concerns of any constituents of sovereign nations, are matters for the Venezuelan people themselves. 
And these concerns are being violently exacerbated and at times driven by blockades and sanctions made to make the economy scream. Where have we heard that before? To force an end not just to the Maduro regime, but to the Bolivarian revolution full stop. And despite this division, the majority of Venezuelans on both sides oppose US military intervention into their country. Extractive industry in Venezuela needs to be understood as a continuation of extraction dating back to Spanish colonization from the 16th and 19th centuries. During this time, a tropical plantation economy based on slave labor gave rise to a powerful agro-exportation complex which supplied cocoa and coffee to Europe and Mexico. Wealthy and often European-descended families dominated this industry, and enslaved and later low-wage laborers on plantations had to rely on family and communal plots for subsistence. As in most former colonies, when Venezuela achieved independence, the political and economic structures that were developed under colonization did not really change. And so European settlers maintained their dominance, their political economic superiority over the Afro-descendant, mestizo, and indigenous majority. The stock market crash of 1929 collapsed agricultural commodity prices at the same time that oil was rising as an export commodity in Venezuela. Capital flew from agriculture to the emerging petroleum industry, with oil concessions going to the same wealthy families that had dominated the agro-export complex. These families took advantage of the influx of oil dollars to shift from exporting to importing food. To deal with the void of local production and consumption, the government initiated agricultural modernization programs in 1936, funded by petroleum dollars. These programs melded industrial production and white supremacy, with efforts aimed at whitening, such as the Law of Immigration and Colonization of 1936 that facilitated white Europeans entering Venezuela and forming agricultural colonies on the most productive agricultural land. The opposition protesters of today are mostly the grandchildren of the middle class that emerged in the period of modernization and whitening, with important links to the country's elite. Oil never fully transformed Venezuela, but rather it created the illusion of modernity in a country where high levels of inequality persisted. Prominent narratives routinely fail to mention that at the start of the Bolivarian Revolution, more than half of the population was living in poverty with hunger levels higher than those of today. Pre-Chavez, Venezuela was hardly a bastion of democracy and stability in the region. In 1989, then-President Carlos Perez accepted an IMF loan, and the consequent structural adjustment policies, which are kind of what people are protesting for today, seized the economy, gas and food prices skyrocketed, and this led to the explosion of Caracas. Called Caracasao, hundreds of thousands of people from the hillside barrios flooded Caracas in a massive uprising that spread across the country. Under Carlos Perez, the military massacred people in the streets, opening fire on civilians and yielding a death toll believed to be in the thousands. Not surprisingly, there was not that much criticism by the New York Times, and Donald Trump has actually come out praising Carlos Perez. Wow! This repression inspired Chavez to lead the Bolivarian Revolution against the government in 1992, which failed at the time, and he was jailed at the time, saying the revolution has failed for now. But he was so incredibly popular with the majority of poor people in the country that he was pardoned in 1994 thanks to mass support. He was then elected president in 1999 with 60% of the vote. Although he left private enterprise still standing in the country, he popularly increased social services and instituted housing projects that gave 1.6 million people free quality housing. His series of economic and social reforms dramatically reduced poverty and illiteracy, as well as improved health and living conditions for millions of Venezuelans. Poverty fell from 49.4% in 1999 to 23.9% in 2012. The reforms included nationalizing key components of the nation's economy, which made Chavez a hero to millions, but the enemy of Venezuelan oligarchs. Of course, as all alternatives to neoliberalism must be brutally crushed, Washington backed an opposition-led coup against Chavez in 2002. Elliot Abrams, the current special envoy on Venezuela, who we'll talk about later, played a key role in this coup too. They kidnapped Chavez and tried to say that he just resigned. He just resigned, everyone. Just don't worry about it. Just, he just didn't, he didn't want to tell you, but he just resigned. At that time, the Bush administration immediately endorsed the new government under businessman Pedro Carmona. The US administration was not only aware the coup was about to take place, but had sanctioned it, working with Carmona for months, presuming it to be destined for success. However, there was a huge backlash and Chavez was back in Caracas within 48 hours after the coup by popular demand, and this only strengthened his popularity. The problem was that these social programs for the poor were largely financed by oil dollars, with over 90% of Venezuela's economy relying on the sector. Of course it was a mistake not to diversify. 
But that's how they were funding feeding the poor as possible. As well, Venezuela has a problem that the US will never have. It owes massive debts in a currency that it cannot print itself, US dollars. When oil was booming, Venezuela was able to meet its repayment schedule. But when the price of oil plummeted, the government was reduced to printing bolivars and selling them for US dollars in international currency exchanges. As speculators drove up the price of dollars, more and more printing was required by the government, massively deflating the national currency. However, as the UN Rapporteur for Venezuela stated in his report, this alone was not enough to lead to such a crisis in Venezuela. Critics point to corruption in the government, but the economic blockade and the series of sanctions slapped on the country have asphyxiated the economy as they were planned to do. Trump's added sanctions are denying Venezuela $30 million per day. The most recent sanctions include exceptions, however to let Chevron and Dick Cheney's former company Halliburton continue to work in Venezuela. As Jeremy Scahill aptly said in a recent episode of Intercepted, that tells you everything you need to know about what's happening right now. So while they are asphyxiating the economy by $30 million per day, and while the Bank of England is sitting on 31 tons of Venezuelan gold that could be used for food and medicines, they are now offering a measly $20 million in aid that is being weaponized to legitimate regime change. And this brings us to propaganda and the most recent brazen aid scandal. The US is offering this aid without going through the proper channels, without coordinating with the Venezuelan government or any international organizations. The Venezuelan government does not know what this aid entails, and can you blame them for being suspect? I mean, Elliot Abrams is known to have used aid to fund right-wing death squads in other Latin American coups. It's not even just the same script that we've seen a hundred times, it's the exact same guy. The Red Cross and the UN have denounced this aid, with the Red Cross spokesperson Christoph Harnisch saying, we will not be participating in what is, for us, not humanitarian aid. UN spokesman Stefan Duarek said, humanitarian action needs to be independent of political, military, or other objectives. And the government is accepting aid from a number of countries. Given that the US and Juan Guaido had given Maduro until February 23rd, critics argued that this was clearly just a Trojan horse meant to incite violence that could then be used to legitimate further intervention. Lo and behold, this is what happened on February 23rd. Using Colombia, led by right-wing Ivan Duque as the staging ground for this intervention, this phony aid stunt has already provoked violent outbursts at the border and four people at least have already been killed. The US has brazenly been provoking violence and also trying to intimidate the army into defecting against Maduro. Guaranteed they are going to do everything to keep escalating this violence, no matter how many people get hurt, no matter whether it starts a civil war in the country, in order to get to a point where internationally they are seen as justified to invade, illegally invade this sovereign nation, which is of zero, zero threat to the United States. Although the media has portrayed the protests as being nationwide, they are largely limited to the wealthiest areas of a very few cities. What you won't see in the mainstream media is that these are protests led by wealthy people, mainly white people, in the name of neoliberalism. This is class war, and it is highly racialized. Opposition protesters have also been brutally violent, particularly in their attacks on people they see as typical chavistas, that is, poor and brown-skinned people, including lynching and torturing them. One horrifying example is Orlanda Figuera, a young Afro-Venezuelan supermarket worker who was burned alive on video. He did not survive this attack, but another victim of a similar background, Carlos Ramirez did, albeit with severe burns covering his body. In 2005, the Carter Center, founded by former President Jimmy Carter, said that Venezuela had one of the freest and fairest electoral systems in the world. Even at that time, the opposition was decrying that the elections were rigged. While concerns have been raised about recent elections, it's not immediately clear that these were just the results of fraud. In 2016, the President of Spain hosted talks between the opposition and the government, supported by the Vatican, where three Latin American states were advising the government and three Latin American states were advising the opposition. One of the demands of of the opposition was to have advanced elections, which was agreed upon. So this was something that was given to the opposition that they demanded. However, many argue that the opposition knew that it could not win these elections democratically because the indigenous, mestizo, and Afro-Venezuelan population still held the majority. There are still 9 million chavistas in the country. So they boycotted the election entirely and then declared it rigged. They lamented that Leopoldo Lopez would have run for the opposition, but he was jailed. But he was jailed for inciting violent events that led to the deaths of 43 people. 
I mean, can you imagine that happening here? Can you imagine a radical left leader in Canada or the United States doing something like that and then A, not being arrested and B, getting to run in upcoming elections? I mean, people get arrested for peacefully protesting here in Toronto. And now the neocons that we've all come to love and trust. Elliot Abrams, a key player in the Iran-Contra scandal and genocide in Nicaragua and Guatemala, and a key architect of the Iraq War, is the point man on Venezuela tasked with defending their democracy and human rights. As Branko Marcelic writes, Abrams' chief claim to fame is his role in Ronald Reagan's blood-soaked foreign policy in Central America in the 1980s, for which he earned the nickname Contra Commander-in-Chief. The Contras were the brutal right-wing paramilitary groups in Nicaragua who terrorized civilians throughout the decade, cutting a swath of torture, rape, and murder aimed at everyone from the elderly to children. Their methods were similar to those of right-wing paramilitaries in the other countries of the region, including El Salvador and Guatemala, all of which were supported by Abrams and the Reagan administration. In Guatemala, President Montt was carrying out what the UN would later call a genocide against the indigenous people of the Axel region, and Abrams was right behind him, lobbying for continued military aid. All in the name of fighting communism, right? The big socialist scare. Ring any bells to today? Abrams was convicted in 1991 for attempting to cover up details of the Iran-Contra scandal while speaking to Congress, but was later pardoned by the Bush administration. Big props to Ilan Omar, who called him out for this before the House Committee on Foreign Relations. I fail to understand uh, why members of this committee or the American people should find any testimony that you give uh, today to be truthful. Honestly, the deeper you dig, the more disgusting it gets. So we've got Abrams, we've got John Bolton, and we've got Shanahan, the new Secretary of Defense, who, as it happens, used to be the CEO of Boeing. Mike Pence. Hola. I'm Mike Pence. Marco Rubio. Nancy Pelosi. Leading the charge for human rights. For Yemenis? No. For Palestinians? No. For Egyptians? Nah. For poor people suffering anywhere around the world under brutal capitalist military dictatorships? No. No. But we care so much, we care so much about the human rights of Venezuelans. Not their oil, not their bucking of neoliberal capitalism, not at all. So honestly, I could go on forever. There's so much more to talk about. I really wanted to talk about the shortages and the way that the media has been spinning that, but I will put resources in the description box or maybe I will do a follow-up video because I want to keep this watchable, but please see what I post in the description box below. Please take a deeper look at this because honestly, if they can pull this off, this is chilling, chilling. If they can just choose whoever they want to be president in wh whatever nation and then throw their economic weight around to make that happen, that is chilling. Do not let the corporate media beat the war drum here. There are millions of Venezuelans who will suffer even further. You want to help? You want to help? Lift the sanctions. Lift the sanctions, stop the coup, and send additional real aid through the proper channels. Thank you from the bottom of my heart to my patrons. You make this show possible. Super special shout out to Holly Mittens. If you'd like to support the show, please become a monthly patron or toss me a donation on PayPal me. Check out my podcast at veganvanguardpodcast.com. Find me on Facebook and Twitter. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you in another video.